It may be true that without Aaron Rodgers, there are teams around the league looking at the Green Bay Packers and going, yeah, now is the time we can beat that team. But that means the Packers are in a position they haven't been in a very, very, very long time. They are underdogs. Something else that they are, that we're going to talk about on today's show, is Fast. They are full of speed. Dirty, filthy, nasty speed. We're going to talk about all of that on today's show. You are Locked On Packers. Your daily Green Bay Packers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski, and I cover the Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you'll find Locked On Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet and the show. For fans who know what happened They want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked on Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. And today's episode brought to you by our friends at Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL for a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NFL for that free Yeti style tumbler with some of the best clothes I own, truly. So I was thinking about narratives, kind of my job, but I was thinking about, okay, what is going to be the storyline going into the season for Green Bay? And what could the storyline potentially be coming out? And I I spoke before on the show, we talked about Matt LaFleur and the pressure that he is under. Part of the reason there's pressure on Matt LaFleur is because He has a background as a teacher. But as I was thinking about his history, the most impressive part of the coaching job done by Matt LaFleur was the job he did back in 2019. It's so easy to forget what disarray this franchise was in coming out of 2018, in the middle of 2018, when they fired a Super Bowl winning head coach in season. That's how bad that organization, that culture had fallen. There was sniping. There was backbiting. There was complacency in the front office. That's why Ted Thompson was no longer in that position anymore. He was also dealing with some health issues. And so in a lot of ways, it was time to transition to a new phase there as well. But there was institutional complacency. Matt LaFleur comes in and to a man, you hear players say, reinvigorates the culture in Green Bay. It wasn't that bad last season that we're aware of at this moment, but it wasn't great. It clearly wasn't great. And now without Aaron Rodgers, I don't know how that's going to change the the dynamic in that room. You have Jair Alexander hugging Jordan Love and saying he's the best quarterback in the league. The vibes for everyone around the league in June are always immaculate. What happens during the season? This team is an underdog now. They haven't been an underdog in a long, long time. Even in 2019, coming off really the only, to that point anyway, bad season we'd ever seen from the Packers in the Aaron Rodgers era, except for his first year as a starter. And even then, they were a good team by DVOA. They got really bad luck at the end of some games that did not reflect the record. They were 6-10, and 10, but they were more like a 10-16 and 16 that year. And so you come off 2018 and you go, okay, now where are they? But what do they do? They go out in that offseason and they pick up Zadarius Smith. They take up Preston Smith, Billy Turner, Adrian Amos. They buttress this roster. They add a new offensive-minded head coach. And 
they have Aaron Rodgers. So long as you have Aaron Rodgers, you are not going to be an underdog coming into the season. But the expectations now have shifted in an enormous kind of way. The expectation is not Super Bowl or bust. The mentality is not, well, it only matters what happens in December and January. And let's call it what it was against the 49ers. The second time, the first time they just got their asses kicked. The second time they played tight. They played not to lose. They played like they were under enormous pressure to make that in that moment work. And and they were, of course, but you don't want to see your best players and maybe your coaches too come up small in that scenario, at least offensively. Aaron Rodgers is, I think, at the forefront of the blame here. You can't lose a game that your defense plays awesome in. You just can't. Now, understanding that the special teams blunders aside, you score 13, you know, you have to score 13 points to win and you can't do it at home. Rested. That's a problem. Whether or not, you know, that was indicative of fall off in play or the pressure getting to them, I, you know, we don't, we can't say for sure. But that sort of pressure doesn't exist now. And I have long believed that some of the malaise that has overtaken this team at times, some of the reasons why, even in the Mike McCarthy era, they would come out and seem sort of disinterested in the first quarter, is because as a team, they sort of had this feeling of, well, this doesn't, ma- we're good enough. This doesn't matter until December, January anyway we can sort of sleepwalk through some of these games. And last year, what they found out, remember the Jair Alexander quote, you know, I'll be worried when we lose to the Jets. And then they got boat raced by the Jets. They got manhandled by the Jets. And it is just one of those things where now the energy shifts and every single week you are going to hear, if you're a Packers player, this team is not it. They're not going to compete for a Super Bowl. They're not going to win these games. Their lowest projected win total, I, I, I can't say for sure, but I would assume in a long time. And so the perspective is different and hopefully the energy is different. When you have young players, it's one thing. But when you have veteran players, now you've got something to prove. Jair Alexander, Kenny Clark, David Bakhtiari, Devondre Campbell, guys like Darnell Savage, Josiah DeGuara, Elton Jenkins, they've been around now. They have something to prove. They know what it's like to win these games. And now you're not expected to win these games. And so how does that change your mindset? Do you bring a little bit more juice? Do you bring a little bit more energy in practice every week knowing, look, they're expecting us to lose. We have to go out every week and prove it. We haven't proven anything. And we don't have Aaron Rodgers to come bail us out. We don't have Superman to save the day. I hope that means they play with a different level of energy, a different level of intensity. I hope that means that they coach differently. They coach more aggressively. We've talked about throwing a little bit more. David Bakhtiari hinted at that on, on social media this week, suggesting that he is going to be in that um, that that shotgun pass protection stance a lot this season. I think they're going to throw the ball a ton this year. I'm glad to hear that. And I hope David Bakhtiari is awesome. I know that there are there are some fans that have questions about his commitment to this team. He knows that there are fans that have questions about commitment to this team. I hope that pisses him off. I personally do not have a question about the commitment of his team, but there are people out there. And I'm not just doing the like, many people are saying this. People are, people are asking him about it. Media is asking him about it. They're asking coaches about it. This is not just some like straw man that I'm putting up here. I know he knows he's addressed it. So that that changes the energy dynamic in your building. Now, the other way is, well, no one expected us to be any good. And so if we lose a couple games, that can roll downhill. 
And you go, okay, well, pack it in. These guys, these are, This is a team used to winning. Josh Myers had a great quote about the expectation here has always been to win. We're, we expect to keep winning. That's the standard. And, and you know what? Credit to Aaron Rodgers, because he has always been that way. The standard is the standard. Credit to Brian Gutekinds. He said it last year. Forget if, if we're not in the playoffs, Aaron Rodgers is sitting. No, no. He's playing because what we do in Green Bay is try and win every single week because we believe the culture of trying to win, of putting your best team forward every single week, pays dividends over time. So I am fascinated to see what this change in status, change in role, teams are going to think they can come for Green Bay's neck now. Can you use that as motivation? Can you find a different gear of energy week to week? Does that change the way you call games? Does it change the way you approach games? And does it change the way you approach, let's say, week one? where the Packers have not had a lot of success over the last few years when you come in going, they're one of the top two or three teams in the NFC. We expect them to be a Super Bowl team. And you go, okay, we know this is a long season. We're, we're doing everything to plan for this long season, including last year. The Packers didn't take their bye after the Giants game knowing that it was going to come later in the season. And that was what they that was when they wanted it because they expected to be prepping for a playoff push. Even without Devontae Adams, they felt like they could get there. This is why this is such an exciting season for the Packers. One of many reasons is because so much is different and the the very starting point of expectations is so different that I think it could actually invigorate, reinvigorate, re-energize in a way Matt LaFleur did in 2019. This is not a dissimilar circumstance from the group he inherited in 2019, the difference is Aaron Rodgers. How much of what happened in 2019 was Aaron Rodgers? Well, the offense wasn't great. They won a bunch of games because the defense was awesome. Now, Aaron Rodgers for stretches in 2019, throwing to not Devontae Adams, but like Aaron Jones was winning games. Aaron Jones making plays. He he beat the Chiefs single-handedly. He beat the Cowboys single-handedly, basically. Zadarius Smith beat the Vikings single-handedly. The defense beat the Bears single-handedly. Twice. So, could that be the same sort of circumstance this season? We've seen Matt LaFleur excel in a similar kind of scenario. And so I think it is easy to have confidence in him being up to the task in this moment. Is the leadership on this team up to the task? Are the players, is the talent level up to the task? We're just going to have to wait and see on that one. I want to talk about speed. I want to talk about speed. One of the most fun things to talk about in football. Before we do that, today's episode brought to you by our friends at Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs are an incredible product that I wear all the time. I have three pairs of the joggers in my closet. I have two pairs of the stretch khakis that I play golf in and I just got the shorts. I have to tell you, I, I I was like, okay, they have the liner. Is is Does that mean these are single wear kind of deals? They're not. You can wear them two, three, four days and not worry about, hey, I got to wash these. Maybe that's TMI. Maybe it's not. <laughs> what I'm telling you is it's a great product. I use them every day and I have I have gone above and beyond using them to spending my own hard-earned money on more of them. So I cannot recommend Bird Dogs to you enough. And guess what? If you go to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL, you can get a free Yeti style tumbler. I just got it. Uh, I just put some iced coffee in it, took it to the zoo with my son. We had a wonderful day. I left it in the car, came back. Guess what? Still wonder. It was a hot day. Still wonderfully cold. Amazing. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NFL for that free Yeti style tumbler. You are not going to want to take your bird dogs off. I promise. And the wonderful thing is you don't have to. Thanks for making Locked On Packers your first listen every day. Every day is next week on the show. We have a lot more to come as we get toward training camp. Um, we had a lot to talk about this week. So saving some of the rookie orientation stuff 
and the Rogers signature series stuff. But I promise you that is coming um, now that mandatory minicamp is closed. We basically got a month before training camp opens. So a ton of stuff to get to over the next couple weeks before we actually get to see these guys in pads when the real fun begins. A couple people on the team mentioned this this week. Jordan Love, Aaron Jones. And they didn't need to mention it because it is kind of jumping off the page. Even if you never watched them, you just look at the numbers. And this team, you know, you go back to 2018, which we talked about earlier. Jordan Nelson, you know, not what he once was. You have, and and that's when you move on after 2017. Randall Cobb, not what he once was. And Devontae Adams, never been a speedster, though obviously one of the best receivers in the league at that time, became eventually the best receiver in the league. You add MVS to the mix. Al Lazard ascends. But even last year, the year before that, you didn't have the same level of speed that you look around the league and you go, man, that team, like think about those those Chiefs teams with Tyreek Hill. You got Tyreek Hill and Michael Hardman and Sammy Watkins, that team that won the Super Bowl. They were so fast on offense. The 49ers are so fast. They're so fast. The Eagles, man, Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown, Miles Sanders, that team was so fast. Defensively, they they flowed fast. They played fast. Now, there is a difference between time speed and play speed. Jordy Nelson always played much faster than his time speed. Devontae Adams played much faster than his time speed. But there is no substitution for speed. And you look at this receiver room. There's speed all over it. They drafted a guy, Jaden Reed, who can fly. The tight ends, like we've been talking about it on the show. Luke Musgrave is a burner at the tight end position to be as fast as he is at the size that he is. He brings, he brings a vertical element of speed that this tight end room has not had really since Jermichael Finley was in the building. And I'm talking pre ACL, like burn you down. Jermichael Finley, 2008, 2009, Jermichael Finley, that guy, that's the kind of athlete Luke Musgrave is. And I think Tucker Craft would probably be the most athletic tight end in Green Bay, also since Jermichael Finley, if not for Luke Musgrave. So they got two of those guys at tight end to go with Christian Watson, to go with Romeo Dobbs. Now, Jaden Reed, Samori Toure has vertical speed, can make plays down the field. In fact, the biggest plays that he made as a rookie were vertical. The plays he was making in preseason, down the field, They are fast. They are fast. Zach Tom, one of the most athletic offensive linemen in his draft class. RAS way north of nine relative athletic score. AJ Dillon is a a bruiser, but in the open field, he can create. Aaron Jones is a home run hitter at running back. And Tyler Goodson, Aaron Jones was just singing his praises. Tyler Goodson can fly. He has got wiggle. He's got juice. He's got explosiveness. They, this is not like when they had, you're hoping Alan Lazard can win on double moves and you're hoping Amari Rodgers can like half juke, half run over someone because he's built like a running back. That's not this team. They have legit speed on offense. That makes them scary, period. It was one of the reasons why, look, I know it's my bit, but that was one of the reasons why Tyler Irvin was so important to this offense in 2020. His horizontal speed, his that jet sweep stuff, that was so difficult for defenses to defend. And we've seen it over the years. When the Packers use jet motion before a run, they are like twice as efficient running the ball. And we're going to see it a ton this year, especially because it's going to get into some of those split zone play action boots that they love to, those little slides where you just dump it off to the running back. Well, if you're going to use jet motion all the time, Now you can make it seem like it's some split zone off jet. And no, it turns out it's a little dump. Defensively, it's the same. 
Like Jair Alexander and Eric Stokes are 4-3 corners. We'll see when Eric Stokes can get back on the field. Darnell Savage, a 4-3-40 guy. Quay Walker, relative athletic score over 9. Him and Devondre Campbell, it, that might be the fastest linebacker duo in football. Rudy Ford, right now the starting safety, 4-3 guy. Even the defensive lineman. Devontae Wyatt is the fastest 40 time at the combine for a guy over 300 pounds ever. Ever. Lucas Van Ness at his like four fives at 270. Fast, explosive. Rashawn Gary, fast effort, explosive. I think you have to go back to some of those early, like 2008, 2009, but even, even those defenses, like Al Harris, not, not a burner. Charles Woodson, not a burner. Those guys were physical. Now, Nick Collins could fly. Clay Matthews, an incredible physical specimen. Like that, that 2010 team, Tremont Williams, Sam Shields, so fast. Nick Collins, incredible speed. Clay Matthews was a, a destroyer of worlds. You had um, BJ Raji, who for a 330-pound guy was extremely nimble. But we've been saying this over the last couple of years. The athleticism on this defense is next level. It's incredible what they've built. Now, can they put it together? Like the game is not played in underwear. It's not played on, on spreadsheets with 40 times and three cones and relative athletic scores and, and all that stuff. I get it. But I really like to have speed over not having it. And you cannot point to very many teams in the modern NFL that have won and won consistently and won at a high level that did not have a lot of speed. Kansas City in this run has been incredibly fast. The Bengals changed their whole like life when they drafted Jamar Chase because he is a big play waiting to happen. Not Yes, Joe Burrow. But if Joe Burrow were just throwing to T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd and C.J. Uzama... It's different. And even if you if, like if you swap Jamar Chase for DeAndre Hopkins, it's okay, another really good receiver. Like, yes, it helps to have another awesome receiver, one of the best like four receivers in the league. Okay, make it nuke instead of Chase. The offense doesn't look the same. It's the speed that makes it look different. The Dallas Cowboys last year, one of the reasons why they could not create explosives, they did not have the speed to press teams vertically. This is one of the concerns I have about the Chargers this year. They just don't have the speed to beat you over the top. It's one of the big reasons Brandon Cooks is huge for the Cowboys because, you know, he's not what he used to be, but he can still absolutely fly. Well, all of the Packers receivers can do that now. Certainly all the ones who are going to play, but even the ones that aren't. Dontavian Wicks, Grant Dubose. These guys are fast. And Christian Watson is fast, fast. He's erased the angles fast. Like Darius Slay was like, yo, this guy is crazy fast. The speed is, is apparent anytime he's on the field. But Romeo Dobbs is a legit vertical threat too. That was his best attribute in Nevada. A 4-4 guy. Jaden Reed can get vertical even from the slot. He is fast in the open field. Fast without the ball in his hand and with the ball in his hand. They've got guys now at every spot where you need speed, where it's nice to have speed. Like, you don't really care about defensive tackles. They have it. You'd much rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. All right, before we finish up, uh, let me tell you, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you being a Locked On Packers listener. I appreciate that Locked On Packers is your first listen every day. Day. I would also appreciate it if you check out Locked On Sports today. All the biggest stories you need in under 20 minutes most nights. It's it's for people who love the Packers, for example, you're listening to the show, um, or the Jets, hi. Uh, and also want to stay up to date on the other biggest stories in sports. Couldn't be easier. I host that one. And would love for you to subscribe to The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Last thing I want to mention is, um, is a reminder that sometimes the best trades are the trades you don't make. According to the reporting, and and you know this matches what I've heard as well, that 
The Packers had a strong offer for Chase Claypool, a second round pick on the table for Chase Claypool. The Bears gave up the pick that ended up becoming the 32nd overall pick. It's the pick that allowed the Steelers to get Joey Porter Jr. Um, And it sounds like, at least according to reports in Chicago from ESPN Radio, the Bears are not thrilled with Chase Claypool. The attitude, the commitment, not there for him. And the productivity last year was terrible. Did nothing. Now in a bad passing offense with a bad passing quarterback. At, you know, Last year, we'll see what he becomes. But last year, that's what he was. To the point that they felt like, even after giving up that high second round pick for him, even with Darnell Mooney in the building, that they had to, in a trade for the number one overall pick, insist on DJ Moore. So the Packers could have had this guy. And maybe he would have cha- maybe he would have been a different guy. Like this is always the case that I hear from, from Packer fans, usually Aaron Rodgers capers, going, well, that guy would be a different player in Green Bay. Maybe, maybe. But also, here's the thing. If Mike Tomlin thinks I can't do anything with this guy, probably means you can't do anything with this guy. Mike Tomlin, one of the best interpersonal communicators and coaches that we have, not in just the NFL, in sports. There have been times when I've gone like sort of, you know, what does he do here exactly? Because it's hard to know how much on the football field he actually affects in terms of the X's and O's, the scheme, all that stuff. Because we're not, we're not there. We're not in those meetings. And it seems like, you know, they cycled through some coordinators and they've had some issues, but As a culture setter, as a leader, as a communicator, he seems to be the absolute goods. Like think of what he was able to manage with Le'Veon Bell and Antonio Brown, guys who were were problems. Antonio Brown, obviously a problem in a way that Le'Veon Bell, Le'Veon Bell just wanted to get paid. Antonio Brown was like a menace. And it turns out is, is still maybe even a bigger menace now since he's out of the NFL. He was on two more teams after the Steelers, three more teams. And was a menace on all of them. So the fact that he was able to manage that situation tells you he's a pretty good coach. If that guy thinks this super talented, six foot five, 240 pound guy who runs 4'3", who is like had an all-time rookie season, one of the 10 best rookie receiving seasons of the last 20 years, if that, if that coach thinks that guy is not part of their future. You probably don't want him. I, I may, I may, maybe should have given that a little bit more credence in the moment because I was like, yeah, yeah, go get Claypool. See what you can do. But I also thought they should make one more run. Go try. The NFC is wide open. Would it have mattered? I, you know, I don't think so. I just, I, I don't think this team, that team was right. I don't think that team was locked in. I don't think Aaron Rodgers was locked in. And I don't think it was ever going to happen, but it is a reminder that sometimes the best trades you make are the ones you don't make. Sometimes the best trades are the ones you don't make. You get it. Sometimes not making the trade is the best trade you can make. Just don't. Just don't. That doesn't mean don't ever make trades. But this, it turns out, this looks like it was a good move for the Packers to not make this deal. Because the Bears are already going, I don't know, I don't know, this guy's, I don't know if he can help us. I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up on the trade block in September, October. All right, more to come next week here on Locked on Packers. I said we might only have three or four shows this week. We ended up having five. Had a lot to say. Had a lot to talk about. That's probably going to happen next week too, but we'll see. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers. And anytime you want to come hang out with us live, we might do a live hangout after some training camp practices just to just to do it, just to have fun, just to feel something, you know? Uh, if you want to do that, you can subscribe to us on our Locked on Packers YouTube page so you can stay Locked on Packers.